Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather together today to dive into your word. And I ask that you sanctify us by your truth, that you help us to know your truth that you have generously and graciously revealed to us in the Holy Scripture. I ask that you help me to be faithful to preach your word accurately, Lord, to rightly handle the word of truth, and that you would draw any who have not come to know you savingly, Lord Jesus, that you would draw them to yourself, and that you would build up your church for your glory and for the magnification of your name. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, I pray this. Amen. Well, as we proceed through the book of James, we are now entering that portion of this epistle, which is dealing with the relationship between faith and works. Does faith alone save us? Is it a combination of faith plus works whereby we are given salvation? What is the exact relationship between faith and works in the life of a Christian? Is it possible for someone who says they have faith, but never actually puts that faith into action by works, is it possible for that individual to actually be truly saved and be given redemption by the Lord Jesus Christ? When Martin Luther many years ago, was trying to understand faith and works and the process of justification, he came to an enlightening moment whenever he understood that justification is given by faith alone, that it is by faith alone that we are made righteous before God, because we are given the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He realized that righteousness, it is not due to our works, it is not due to our own merit, but solely based on the righteousness of Christ received through faith. But there was a little bit of a language trick that kept him from understanding, or at least kind of darkening his understanding on this concept for many years, that he did not come to this comprehension of true justification until well into his life as a theologian. The Latin word justificare is where we get our word justification from in the English language. And the Latin word justificare, it came from the Roman judicial system. And it is made up of two Latin words. One of them is the Latin word justice, which in English simply means justice or righteousness. The other Latin word is facere, which means to make. And so the Latin church fathers, they understood this term justificare to reference what happens when God makes someone righteous. They saw this as primarily happening through the sacraments of the church. But whenever Luther came to the Greek word for justification, the word that the original text actually has, because it was a language in the New Testament that the apostles wrote, he understood that the Greek term meant to regard or to count or declare as righteous. And upon discovering this, Martin Luther says, he says, you mean here Paul is not talking about the righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but a righteousness that God God gives freely by his grace to people who don't have righteousness of their own. And he goes on and he says, Whoa, you mean the righteousness by which I will be saved is not mine. And so what is Luther understanding here? He is understanding what would become one of the foundations for the Protestant Reformation, which is the truth that we are not justified by faith plus works. We are not justified by works. We are justified by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, that we are given his righteousness on the basis of his grace. And we receive this righteousness through faith. But what we are going to see in James 
is the fact that as a result of this salvation, as a result of being declared justified by God, we will work. We will seek to glorify the Lord and live in obedience to his commandments. Let's read the text, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And so in these verses, we see a flow of thought that goes between all five of them. In verse 14, we have a couple of questions. In verses 15 and 16, we have an example that James is giving us to illustrate what he is talking about. In verse 17, we have the answer to the questions that James raises. And then in verse 18, we have an objection that James is going to deal with. And now as we go through the rest of this chapter, James chapter 2, all the way down through the last verse, verse 26, we have to remember the fact that the questions given in verse 14 are the backdrop through which we have to interpret the rest of this chapter. The key to understanding James chapter 2 is understanding the questions that we are given in verse 14. And so for that reason, you will probably hear me reference them quite often over the next few sermons because they are critical to rightly interpreting this passage in its context. And so let's look at these questions raised in verse 14 so that we can have a good foundation and understanding before we proceed into the rest of the text. The first question that James asks is, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And so what type of a situation is James seeking to address here? This is a person who is saying that they have faith, who is claiming to know the Lord and claiming to believe in him, but they never actually work. They never actually seek to live in obedience to what they actually profess. They never do anything other than say that they believe. They, they are merely making a statement. There is no actions behind this statement. They are not doers of the word. In fact, this is a familiar scenario for us because if you remember back in James chapter 1, if we read verses 23 through 24, we see this. It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And so this individual... They hear the word, they know the word, but they're not actually doing the word. They're not actually living in obedience to it. They merely hear it. And they're actually going away and they're literally forgetting what they hear. And so in a similar way, whenever we come to James in chapter 2, we see that he is talking about a person who is proclaiming to have faith but never actually lives in obedience to God's word. They perhaps hear the truth, but they don't actually put it into action. They don't do what the Lord has commanded. And so James is driving right at the heart here. He is asking, does this faith do any good? And in fact, he goes on and he asks in the second question, he says, can that faith save him? And so what James is going to be addressing is ultimately what type of faith is true faith? Well, what type of faith actually saves? What does saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ actually look like? Is it possible for someone to claim faith but never actually work and still be saved? That is the heart of this text, is discerning what true saving faith is and how works relate to true saving faith. 
How can we ourselves identify whether we have true faith? How can we discern what true faith looks like? That's what this text is addressing. What does it really look like to have a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And so these are the questions that James is going to be driving at in the rest of chapter 2, that he is going to be elaborating on these things. And as he often does, James gives us a very practical example to help us understand what he is talking about. Look at verse 15. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in food. And so the very first thing that should come to mind whenever we see this example here is what James has been talking about in verses 1 through 13 of this passage. He has been discussing how we are to relate to the rich and the poor. He has discussed the fact that we are not to show partiality, but we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so he is giving this illustration here in James chapter 2 of a poor brother or a poor sister who is in need. And we have knowledge of their needs. They are literally in the depths of poverty to the extent that they are hungry. They are lacking in food. They are lacking in clothing. And so this poor Christian is in need in James's example. And the individual who should do something about it says this in verse 16. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? And so this poor person comes and the individual in our modern vocabulary basically tells them, God bless you, go in peace, and I hope you find clothes and food. That's essentially what they're saying. That doesn't do any good. That doesn't actually help this person in their need. All you are doing is telling them something while not helping them in their moment of crisis. This person doesn't care about the poor individual. They just want to say something to make themselves feel good and then move on about their lives. They are just brushing off the needs of this poor person. It does no good whatsoever to have this type of a response. This person is clearly not loving their neighbor as the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to. There is nothing whatsoever profitable in this action. Now remember that this is just an example. This is an example to elaborate on the questions that James asked in verse 14. And so he is trying to illustrate what it means for someone to say they have faith but have no works. And this illustration shows that it profits nothing. It doesn't do any good for the individual to give a blessing on the poor person, a blessing of peace, but not actually help them. In the same way, it does no good for someone to say they have faith whenever they never actually live in obedience to the Lord. Which that is why James. James actually ties this example back to the thought process he started in verse 17. He says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So just as the person who tells the poor brother or who tells the poor sister to go on has been useless, so also faith without works is useless. But what does this mean? Does this mean that faith must have works added to it for salvation to actually take place? Does it mean that faith alone does not save? Does it mean that we have to partially work to earn our own salvation? Well, let's start with the clear teaching of Scripture regarding justification, regarding understanding how we are made right before God. Scripture says this in the first part of Romans 3.20. It says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And so as we have studied before, no one will obtain salvation by their own works. No one is going to be saved by their own righteousness. And Paul goes on and he says this in Romans 3.28. For we hold that no one is justified 
or for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And so not only are we not justified by the keeping of the law, we are actually justified by faith that is completely apart from, separate from, the works of the law. It is by faith alone and not by faith plus works. People often object and say, especially our Catholic friends, they say that the phrase faith alone is not in the Bible. Well, how much clearer can you get than this verse right here? It says in Romans 3 that we are saved by faith apart from works. Faith apart from works is faith alone. That is the clear teaching of Scripture. That is the way that God has always bestowed salvation. It is through faith alone, even back in the Old Testament. To prove this point, Paul uses the example of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 3 of Romans 4 is actually a quotation where Paul is going way back in the Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And what we see is that Abraham believes God and he is given righteousness. He is counted as righteous before God. It is not on the basis of Abraham's own works that he is counted as righteous. It is on the basis of God's grace, God's mercy, God's salvation received through faith. And so now we come to an interesting point here. Because many have proposed that there is a contradiction between Paul and James at this point regarding the concept of justification and how faith and works operate together. What we see in James is that faith apart from works is dead. What we have seen Paul clearly teach is that we are saved, we are justified by faith alone. And so many say there is a contradiction. And we can't just glance over this. We have to dig into the scripture and understand it. Even the great reformer, Martin Luther, had difficulty in understanding this issue. He actually offered his doctor's cap to anyone who could solve it for him. Some individuals have gone so far as to say that Paul actually wrote Romans to correct James's errors in his epistle. Now, that is completely false. There is no contradiction here whatsoever. Actually, I would go so far as to say that not only is there no contradiction, these teachings are perfectly complementary as all of Scripture is. Here's a couple of things that I want you to notice. So remember that we have Paul in Romans. He is going back to the Old Testament. He is going back to Genesis 15, quoting this verse, saying that Abraham believed God, and that is why he was counted as righteous, that it was not by his works, but through faith. Well, if you come to James in chapter 2, verse 23, James quotes that exact same verse. He says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So right here, where many say that James is contradicting Paul, he quotes the exact same verse that Paul does in order to prove that justification is by faith alone and not on the basis of works. And so James is clearly affirming that Abraham was justified by faith, by belief, not by his works. Not only that, but James has also affirmed the fact that salvation is of the grace and the will of God. If you look back in James chapter 1, verses 17 through 18, you'll see this. James chapter 1, 17 through 18 says... 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so we are brought forth in salvation according to the will of God. It is by his will that we are saved. It is of the power of his grace. And so what is James saying? Whenever we come to chapter 2, what is he saying whenever he mentions works? Remember the fact that the whole discussion has to be understood in light of the questions in verse 14. That those are pivotal for understanding the whole passage. The key here is to understand that James is trying to say what type of faith saves. He is trying to tell us what true saving faith looks like. And so this faith, completely void and separated from any sort of works, a faith that is claimed but that never works, does that type of faith save? That is what he is addressing, and that is why in verse 17 he says that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James is reminding us that true faith will work, which I might also add the Apostle Paul taught the exact same thing. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. How much clearer can you be? Salvation is not of works. But then he goes on to say in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what do we see Paul teaching here in this passage? He says that salvation is by grace through faith apart from works. But as a result of this salvation, we will work. That we have been saved, we have been created in Christ Jesus to work for his glory. And so we see Paul quoting Genesis, saying that Abraham is an example of someone who is justified by faith alone, because that is the only way any human being is justified. We see James quoting that same verse as an example for justification by faith alone. We see James teaching that true faith leads to works, that faith apart from works is actually dead. And so he is telling us that true salvation will always lead to a heart that seeks to obey Christ. And we just read here in Ephesians that Paul says that true faith leads to works, that we are created to work. And so where is the contradiction that has been alleged here in these passages? There is no contradiction. These passages of Scripture clearly complement each other and help us to understand how true justification operates. The truth of the gospel is that we are justified by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the truth of the gospel is that whenever true salvation is given, the heart of that person will seek to work for the glory of the Lord. This fact means that someone could not say they were saved if they never work, if they never seek to work. That would be an incorrect statement because true faith always works. And look at the objection that James brings up in verse 18. He says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so what is James doing in this passage? He is showing others that his faith is actually working. That his faith is leading to action. His works demonstrate the fact that he is truly saved. His works honor God because works are the fruit of salvation. But they also, they also justify his faith to other human beings. Notice that he is showing his faith by his works in this passage. And so others see our works 
and they see that as the evidence that God has transformed us, that he has given us salvation. Our works demonstrate salvation, that salvation has occurred. They demonstrate that to others. They honor God, and they are the fruit of saving faith. And in this passage, James is challenging the person who claims to have faith but never actually works. He is challenging them to show their faith, and he will show their, him their, his faith by his works. Because this person, this person who claims to have faith but never actually lives in obedience, their faith is useless. Their faith is a fraud. It is empty. It is impotent. And it will not save. They show the uselessness of their faith by the fact that it never works. And I want you to pay special attention to the last phrase here in this verse. It says, I will show you my faith by my works. And so we are left with the final pivotal question that we must look at this morning. It is this, what does true saving faith actually look like? What does it mean for faith to demonstrate itself by works? Back in my high school and college years, I was a competitive trap shooter, a clay target shooter, at a world and national level. It probably dominated a higher place in my life than it should have. But one thing that was always interesting in that type of a competitive environment was to hear the number of people who said that they wanted to be great shooters, who said that they wanted to be really good at the sport. Many actually made that statement, but few actually put the work in in order to be great. A lot of people would say that they love to go out and shoot at the tournaments and at the competitions, and that they wanted to be good, but they would say that they actually hated to practice. Me and some of my friends, we would go out to the gun club, and we would shoot sometimes four to 500 shells in a practice session. We, we would shoot whenever there was ice and snow on the ground and the wind was blowing 20 mile an hour. And on the other end of that weather spectrum, we would shoot whenever it was so hot that there was literally people passing out on the line. The point is that whenever we said we wanted to be good, we actually backed that up by going out and working and practicing. Not only did we practice, we would actually practice very strategically and very intentionally. We would structure our practices so that we would be well-rounded shooters, not just focusing on one thing, but focusing on being good at several things. Whenever one of us was struggling, we would hammer that specific thing so that we could be better at what our weaknesses were. We would have coaches and Hall of Famers and others come and watch us shoot so that they could make sure that we were practicing well and that we were accurately understanding the fundamentals and executing those in this sport. I remember multiple occasions where I would even have someone video every single shell that I would shoot in a 200 round practice session. They would video me and then I would go home and watch it in slow motion, trying to pick up on any little mistake that I could find. It wasn't just that we were practicing. It wasn't just that we were working hard. We were actually doing things very intentionally in every single action that we did when we practiced so that whenever we went to the tournaments and we went to the competition, we weren't hoping that we would show up prepared. We were putting the work in beforehand. Those individuals who said that they wanted to be great, they wanted to be good at the sport, but they didn't actually practice. They didn't want to be great at what they were trying to accomplish. They didn't really want to be a great shooter. Those individuals who said that they wanted to be great, but they didn't take the time to learn how to actually practice and how to execute in the sport, they didn't really want to be great either because they didn't take the time to learn. You could tell whenever someone wanted to be great because they 
would go and they would shoot the shells in the practice sessions. You could tell it by how well they practice. You could tell it by how consistent their results were every single time they stepped up to the line, that it wasn't just a once off whenever they had a good round. It was every single time they were breaking good scores. In the same way, those individuals who profess to love the Lord Jesus Christ, but don't actually work for him, they don't really love him. Those individuals profess to love the Lord, but they are just doing their own thing. They aren't coming to his word and seeking to see how they should live. And they demonstrate the fact that they have never been truly saved. They do not know the Lord. But on the other side of that, we're talking about this person who claims to have faith but doesn't have works. But on the other side of this, we have to make the statement that there are going to be a lot of people who do good works according to a human standard who will bust the gates of hell wide open. The Lord Jesus Christ said this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you were workers of lawlessness. And so you may be here this morning, and you may volunteer all of your time in the church. You may volunteer at the homeless shelter down the road. You, you, you might work at who knows what all else. But the question is, do you know Christ? Do you know the Lord savingly? Have you come to know him through saving faith? Good works are obedience to the word of God, seeking to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and not to glorify our own selves. And so do you obey the word for the Lord or for your own interests? Because of your own pride to make your own name great. Do you obey to magnify the name of Christ or to magnify yourself? Do your good works proceed from a heart of love for the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they proceed from a heart seeking to honor him? John the Baptist understood the intention of his ministry. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease in John 3.30. And so do your good works spring forth from that type of a heart? That is a heart that is truly saved, a heart that is truly seeking to magnify the Lord. In reading these passages in James, it is important that we understand two things and that we seal them in our hearts and minds. First of all, our faith must work or it is not true saving faith. The person who claims to have faith but doesn't work isn't truly saved. They are not converted. They do not know the Lord. And so are you here this morning and find that you fall under this type of a category of an individual? A false type of faith. This is a dangerous warning given by James regarding the danger and the heresy of false views of faith. A mistake here leads to damnation for eternity. If you believe that you are justified by your works, you will not be saved. If you believe that you are justified by faith plus works, you will not be saved. If you believe that you are justified by faith alone, but you never actually work and seek to live in obedience to Christ, you will not be saved either. If you believe that you are justified by faith alone, 
by a faith that is truly placed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are trusting in him as your righteousness, that you understand that you are saved by grace alone. And as a result of that salvation, you then seek to work. You will be saved. Those good works demonstrate that you have been given salvation. You understand that it is not by those works that you are saved, but whether those works demonstrate the fruit of saving faith. The works didn't save you, but Lord Jesus Christ saved you. And as a result of that salvation, you work. So are you truly saved? Are you converted? Do you know the Lord? Do you have assurance of your salvation? James is not saying that you will work perfectly after your conversion. That is not the argument of James. You know, I never saw a trap shooter who had perfect scores after they went out and decided to go and practice. I wish I could say I had the perfect scores, but I didn't have the perfect scores after I practiced. And so James is not saying here that whenever you determine the work for the Lord that you are going to do so perfectly, any more than a trap shooter is going to be perfect just because they decide to practice. He is saying that you are going to grow. He is saying that you are going to live in obedience. You are going to seek to obey the Lord. You, you are not going to seek to wallow in the sin that offends the Lord Jesus Christ and that he came and died for. You are going to seek to obey him. And so have you been justified by Christ? Have you placed true faith in him? Do you know him in a saving way? If you do not, then you must turn to him and be saved. You must place true faith in Christ. You must repent of your sins, turn from them, and turn to follow the Lord and seek to live in obedience to him. And then as a result of that, you will seek to honor him in all of your life. And that brings me to the second area that we must be careful to understand as we examine this passage and that we must remember. And that is the fact that our good works must spring forth from a transformed heart. They must come from the heart of a person whose motivation is to seek to glorify the Lord. Paul said this. He said that Christ would be honored in his body, whether by life or by death, in Philippians 1.20. The reality is that if you do good works, but you do them for your own self-promotion, if you do them for your own self-pride, if you don't do them to honor the Lord but to honor self, then you are no more saved than the person who does no works at all. You are a person working, but you are working for the wrong reasons. What you do may be commanded in Scripture, but the reasons that you are doing it are actually contrary to Scripture. You may demonstrate external obedience, but you do not have an internal transformation, the internal work of the Holy Spirit that saves you and that leads to true works. George Whitfield, the great evangelist, he demonstrated the type of attitude that we should have in our works. He said this, Let the name of Whitfield perish, but Christ be glorified. Let my name die everywhere. Let even my friends forget me. If by that means the cause of the blessed Lord Jesus may be promoted. Who cares if you or if I or if any of us as human beings are remembered? Who cares if anyone knows our names 100 years from now? What matters is that the Lord Jesus Christ's name is exalted. What matters is that we spend our lives promoting and advancing his gospel, preaching his word, and living to honor him. And so true faith, true faith seeks to glorify the Lord by living in obedience to him. That is what it means to demonstrate faith by works. And so are you here this morning realizing that you've been working, you've been doing good things according to human standard, but you haven't been doing them for the right reason. You haven't been doing them to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. You haven't been doing them to glorify the very one who tells you what is good and what is evil. 
You haven't been doing them to honor Christ. You've been doing them for your own purposes. If so, I urge you to turn to Christ, to repent of your sins and to place faith in him, to come to the Lord for salvation. Those good works will not save you. Those good works will land you into an eternal hell. But if you place faith in Christ, you will be saved, and you will be given the privilege to work for him in this life, however long he sees fit to leave you on this earth. And then whenever he takes you from here, and he takes you to himself, you will be given the privilege of worshiping him and glorifying him and serving him for the rest of eternity. And so all of us must remember the importance of obedience to the Lord, but the importance of doing these good works for his glory, for his magnification, and for the sake of his name. The importance of walking according to his holy ways is a result of the salvation we have been given. And so I'm going to be standing over here after the service. And if you need prayer or if you need to talk about anything, I would be more than happy, privileged to talk with you and to discuss things with you or to pray for you no matter what it may be. But I pray that if you have not come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you will come today. That you will come today to salvation. And that we as the church will see the importance of living according to the word. Let's close this time in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this privilege to proclaim your truth. I thank you for the privilege to read your revelation in the word. And I thank you for the privilege of being able to live according to that for the glory of the Lord. Not because we in our own strength are able to justify ourselves, but because we have been justified by you justified by you on the basis of the work of Christ. And we are then transformed through the power of your Holy Spirit to live for your glory, once again because of your grace. You not only save us by your grace, you also enable us to work for you by your grace. And so I ask that you help us to live in obedience to you, and that you draw those here who may not have come to know you savingly to yourself. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.